Well, we're joined today by Bob McElvain. Uh, he's a retired school teacher from the Philadelphia area whose son, uh, Robert Jr., worked for Merrill Lynch as an assistant vice president of media relations. And on that morning, he was at a banking conference on the 106th floor of the North Tower. He's one of the, uh, Bob Sr. is one of the few uh, family members to openly challenge the official narrative. He's traveled the country and the world uh, as a featured guest at peace conferences and 9-11 events. Uh, he appears in the film Zero, an investigation into 9-11. He's dedicated his life to uh, discovering the truth and seeking justice for his son and all the rest who perished on that day. So please join me in welcoming Bob McElvain. I, I have something here. I've never done this before when I speak, but I, I'm going to read this in a couple minutes. But I, um, Mark said it. Bobby did not die on the 106th floor. And uh, <laughs> I'm getting emotional. Right? I do this every year. And Lionel, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> I just don't have no jokes. Not that he's joking, but I mean, he was great. Everyone's been great. But I just wanted to say that, that Bobby, Bobby worked at Merrill Lynch. He'd only been there like three weeks. Uh, he was assistant vice president. Uh, they hired him because he was just such a phenomenal writer. He wanted to be a novelist. Uh, they made a deal with him that they would send him to graduate school at either Harvard or uh, Penn if, they did, if he worked two years for him. And after two years, he could make that decision whether or not to leave. Well, he, suppose they did have a conference on the 106th floor. But, and again, I don't want to go into detail. Oftentimes, I do talk about Bobby because it, it's, I know what happened to Bobby. And I hate to get in conflict with other family members around, around the United States you know, talking about what I think of the grand scheme of 9-11. But Bobby got out. He lived in 96 between first and second. Or, yeah, 66 between first and second. And every day would go to the uh, John Jay uh, College right there. I think there was an entrance to the subway. I think go down to Fulton Street. And I've, it's, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. I mean, I just didn't. You know, we came up immediately. Well, anyway, he, came, he got off at Fulton Street, walked down to the towers, and I don't know if he was cutting through the tower or walking up to the 106th floor, but I can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he died instantly from an explosion, and I really do believe it was before the towers were hit by a plane. And again, I'm not going to go into the gruesome details, but we found him on Thursday and took him home. Excuse me. Took him home Friday and buried him the following Tuesday. So we were one of the lucky few that actually had a body to take home with us. And that's something special. That my wife Helen is here now. Uh, we spent a good hour at the grave last night or yesterday afternoon just to, you know, pay, you know I go there every week. And not many not only family members have that. So that's something special. So again, I didn't come here to talk about Bobby. I could go on for hours about Bobby. He was a Princeton grad, great writer, so forth. So he really, he knew where he was going in life. And he was a very progressive person, especially coming out of Princeton, you know, a very conservative college or university. And he was a tremendous writer. All right, so let me just go on from that. My wife, she is here, and I want to thank Richard Gage last year, my wife, first time she's come to an event that I came to, she's always supported me about 9-11, but just wanted to stay away from it. You know, she wouldn't criticize me, she wouldn't say anything, but I did my own thing. Well, she listened to Richard last year, and she just loved the science, not loved it, but the science of what happened to those buildings. Because Bobby died at the North Tower, he didn't die from the collapse, she knew that, but the science is you know, it, it just opened up her eyes. So she's been a big part in the last year and in this speech that I have right here. And it's called Connecting the Dots. And then I've always said, and I firmly believe this, and I tell people this, but I was a history teacher, but that's about as far as it goes. I was a bar owner also. So, you know, I'm not, you know, a legal expert or anything of that sort. But I love reading history. I read more history than I do read stuff about 
it's understanding the nature of man. How can men do things like this? As I, uh, Lionel was saying, or, or Mark was saying, he said that someone said that people just can't believe that the United States would do something like this. Just can't wrap, wrap their minds around it. I don't talk about 9-11. My wife doesn't want to take me to parties because she's so afraid that I'm going to talk about it. And I said, I would never bring it up. But if someone would ask me a question, I'll talk about it. Well, even that, she gets upset because people just get so glassy-eyed. And it's just like, you know, it, it's like the father image. How can your father be that evil to do something like that? So that's why people can't wrap themselves around it. So the history part of it is so important to me. And, but for me to come up here, again, I'm not an authority on history. People want to hear my story, what happened on 9-11. Well, two people that are here this weekend, William Pepper, of course, I read his books, and it's his book that's out now, uh, Who Killed Martin Luther King, uh, and his other books, and I, I know William from other events that we've had. And... Danny Sheehan, I saw his four-part, or listened to his four-part uh, show on the Gary Knoll show. Well, that should be heard by everyone in the United States and throughout the world. It's <laughs> so it changed my mind what I was going to do today, and I hope I still have time. I hope I don't get cut off here. But it just changed my mind. Let's just talk about you know, I'm not going to talk about history, but I'm going to talk about my journey and how people should look, you know, do their research and, and hearing the judge talk about Operation Gladio, which I just mentioned in here. This is the most important thing. Everyone has to understand how the politics of the world works, how money works. It's the power. It's the extreme power. And I think if you really spend that time looking at history, then you can understand 9-11 can happen. You know, 3,000 people died. You know, again, as I mentioned here, and I'll, you know, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll get to it real fast, but you know, I've been to Colombia, I've been to Japan, I walked with the Bakasha, and the horror around the world forever. And who benefits from this? You know, Smedley Butler's book, War is a Racket. And that's, so the essence, that's what, that's the way I feel, and I feel good about that because I don't have to worry about. It. Let's just talk. You know, we talk about, uh, you know, Shanksville. Let's talk about the buildings coming down. Let's talk about uh, NORADs, and it just goes on and on and on. And of course, if I'm sitting with someone, that, that just goes above their head. So anyway, my wife and I and my son actually helped in this also. We put this together. It's uh, called Connecting the Dots. I got to take my glasses off. Connecting the Dots of 9/11 by Robert Helen and Jeffrey. How I learned that peace may never be achieved. Get myself in order here. Since, since Bobby's death on 9-11, I have been on a journey to find the truth of how and why he died and who really killed him. I was not satisfied from the beginning with the official story of his death. I also feared that violence around the world would escalate as a result of this horrendous act. In 2002, I joined September 11th Family for Peaceful Tomorrows, a group of activists whose name was inspired by a Martin Luther King state statement, wars are poor chisels for carving out peaceful tomorrows. In the early part of the new decade, we marched hand in hand for peace in Washington and New York, hoping that 9-11 would not be justification for increased war efforts. I'll never forget the moment when I was arrested on the Capitol lawn, proudly carrying a banner stating, not in my son's name, with a picture of his, picture of Bobby right here, which referred to the use of 9-11 by Bush to further any war efforts. Later that year, at the World Conference of Victims on Victims of Violence in Bogota, Colombia, I told Bobby's story to a packed audience of survivors of various atrocities. 
I was honored to have the opportunity to share my pain and grief with those who truly understand the price of violence. Back in the United States, I regularly attended the 9-11 Commission hearings, patiently listening to testimony while hoping to find answers to an official story that contained or continued to make little sense. Instead, I felt frustrated with the inability of the Commission to discover anything new or enlightening. Witnesses, including Condoleezza Rice, were not accountable to the Commission or the American people. Ms. Rice, to my dismay, filibustered her way through each of the questions posed by the commissioners. I returned home very, very discouraged. In 2005, on the 60th anniversary of the atomic bombing, I was asked to join Peaceful Tomorrows on a march from Nagasaki to Hiroshima. And in that march, we pushed or pulled a 2,000 pound tombstone. And honoring those who died in war. I walked beside the Hibakusha, survivors of the attack. They showed amazing pride, never taking on the role of a victim, though many were treated as outcasts by their own people. The Hibakusha's courage impressed in me the need to continue my quest for peace and truth. I returned home deciding that the United States, if the United States government was not going to give me the answers to 9-11, then I'd find them myself. Why, I wonder, was it so hard to go against the government's version of a story that did not make sense? I wanted to know why the media always seemed as far from a free press as one could imagine, often ignoring obvious breakthroughs in information. Why also did peace seem even further away than before 9-11? Frustrating, of course, myself and the peace community. Our children died that horrible day, and it was now being used as fodder for more escalation, more deaths. My quest for truth took me to both the traditional history sources, as well as books written by outstanding authors who questioned the company line and sought deeper answers than what was offered by the news or the press conferences. As I searched, I recall quotes from Eisenhower, Kennedy, Franklin Roosevelt, Martin Luther King, initially read years ago by me, when their dire warnings meant little to a young college student studying history, by the way. Eisenhower, in a famous speech in 1961, warned of the dangers of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Kennedy, later that year, warned of a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covert means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. Fascinated by these predictions of such, of such stellar leaders, I began to probe further, seeing patterns, taking a harder look at the circumstances leading to the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. I looked further back, farther back in history, reading about Operation and Gladio in the Gulf of Tonkin in a different, more knowledgeable light. Was 9-11 another false flag? I was beginning to see the truth. I wondered if presidents truly had any power to wage peace, where special interest groups with, with unimaginable wealth and power, who are often referred to as the shadow government, shadow masters, deep state, controlling the decisions of war. After more continued research, I learned that these clandestine operations would never allow control of the government to the people. They would instead rely on disinformation, weapons of mass description in, in Iraq. It's obviously a perfect example. Fabrication of injustices and the spreading of propaganda to justify their aggressive acts. Could these elite few be responsible for the upheavals in so many countries when it appeared to the general public that they were in these countries to spread 
or promote democracy. As I continue my reading, I re recall a quote from Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's cop, uh, propaganda minister. You tell a big lie enough and keep repeating it, pe people uh, eventually come to believe it. He went on to say that the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie. And thus, by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Sadly, I came to the conclusion, best said by Woodrow Wilson, and for fortunately true today. We have come to one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the civilized world. No longer governed by opinion, no longer governed by conviction and the vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and the duress of small groups of dominant men. From hours and hours of research, I have learned that the 9-11 the truth of 9-11 and the truth regarding who really holds the power in this country and throughout the world are not in our best interest to know, according to those elite few who choose to control our destiny. Unfortunately, peace and the truth are not part of that destiny. Thank you.